going to talk today um, about um, firstly introduce the, the beef processing test and give an overview. Um, as Mark said, um, Richard Schofield and Matt Smith will actually give you the, the hands-on experience of that um, on their op operations. Um, and then I'll also talk a little bit about um, some of the economics work that, um, that we're doing at the moment. So when I actually, when we first started to set up this program, um, we sort of stepped back and asked what's the big picture question. And actually it's exactly the same question that Kent was talking about earlier, which is, um, we, we just use different language around it over, over here a little bit. So essentially the questions, that, the big picture questions that we saw were, what's the right type of cow for the hill country? So that's the maternal part of it. Um, how are we going to be able to um, maximise our finishing performance and particularly um, compliance to market specs? So branded beef programs, um, you know, we, we have some that are run sort of aligned to breed programs. Um, we've now got Beef EQ. Um, which is non-breed specific, but again, um, is, is a program which rewards um, people for producing high quality beef. Um, and so how are we going to target those sort of programs and maximise the, the, the gains we can get out of, out of in, even improving the quality of our beef even further? But most importantly, how do we balance this all up? So um, they're really the, the essence of, of cattle breeding issues. Um, but but here in New Zealand, um, you know, we talk about hill country and the right type of cows. And um, look, everyone in this room knows exactly what the right type of cow for the hill country is. It's just that you don't all agree with each other. Um, and so part of this program is, is, um, is trying to just shed some light on that. Um, so I'll, I'll just skip through, through that slide because that says roughly the same thing. So we've set up the beef progeny test and really it's got three broad objectives. Um, and, and it is very much focused on commercial operations, so the value of, of beef at the commercial beef farming system. So the first one is simply to quantify the value that better genetics can produce in a commercial operation. So how much, how much money is genetics worth, in essence, to, to the commercial farmer? Um, the second one is, I guess, um, to give us an opportunity to demonstrate how we can use um, the tools that we have and the tools that are coming down the pipeline um, to, to select our animals, um, to make them appropriate to the environment and our particular farming system, um, not both individually and, and nationally, um, and, and to be able to use those tools and give, I guess, particularly people who are purchasing bulls, um, the confidence that those tools, if used properly, are taking us in the right direction. So um, we really need that, that confidence. And the third, the third thing is to use, um, to collect a, a information which is going to enable us to improve the toolkit. So for example, um, as an example, um, Mark just talked about um, body condition score um, and the genetics of, of that trait. Um, so we will collect information that, that helps us in that area. Um, or the, the question that came up before about um, you know, how can we develop the sort of the, the genomic tools that Zoetis have, how can they be developed and trained in New Zealand? And um, you know, one of the answers to that is that we need um, information and data, um, and so the information that comes out of these programs will be useful in terms of being able to further develop those tools and to validate them, to see that they're really taking us in the right direction. So in essence, the beef progeny test um, is structured much like um, any other progeny test. I should say that the aim is not so much to, to, um, to get proofs on young bulls. The, the, so most of the bulls that we've actually used in here are actually well proven in, in, the, in, in breeding herds. Um, but what we're doing, I guess, is really then taking that proof from the breeding herd and looking at how it, how it works um, in the commercial situation. Um, so we have a bunch of, um, of a range of bulls um, of different types and you know, we've actually deliberately gone out and targeted um, a range of types within the breeds that we're working in and, and using those of course across um, some, some cow herds and I'll talk a little bit more about the cow herds in a minute. So the plan is um, we'll produce steers and much, um, you know, many of the, in, of the measurements that we'll do will be um, strongly aligned to, to the, the measurements already done in, in, um, in your herds and in breed plan. Um, we'll measure the growth performance of those animals during finishing. We'll take the ultrasound scans to, 
to um, to get live animal um, carcass indicators, and then we'll, we'll slaughter them and importantly um, get actual carcass information. So um, we'll take the steers through down that path. The heifers, um, as many as are viable to do, um, we'll take those, well firstly we'll grow them out and, and do the same sort of thing, um, get ultrasound scans on them, but then we'll take them through into the cow herd. And so we'll get the traits like days to calve and we'll measure fertility. Um, I've got up there on, on the slide um, a, a trait called antral follicle count, which is um, something else that we're going to have a look at. It's a scan of the ovary. Um, and some of the early indicators from the US are that um, it may be a trait which is a useful early life predictor of fertility. Um, jury's out on that, so, so that's a little bit more researchy, I suppose. Um, but we'll take those, those cows into the cow herd um, and, and really do a reasonably simple um, program on them by probably looking at them three times a year, um, probably just at the end of winter, just prior to, prior to calving, um, again at marking and again at weaning. And, and the sort of things that we're asking is, firstly, is the cow there? Is she, is she still in the herd? Um, what does she weigh? What's her condition score? Um, is she pregnant or empty at, at scanning? And possibly what date did she conceive using conception date? Um, is she wet or dry um, at calf marking? And then um, potentially, you know, if, if she left the herd, do we know why she left the herd? And I think what we're going to find is that um, if you look at that sort of little schematic on the, um, on the right-hand side there, that we'll have bulls um, there where um, after a period of time, you know, by, by even four years, we'll find that some bulls, the daughters have a really high retention rate in the herd, and other bulls, the daughters will drop out of the herd um, for, for a variety of reasons. So, so that's my guess as to what's going to happen. Um, and to me, that's the ultimate, I guess, proof of the pudding is, is how long can, that, can, can those daughters stay in the herd um, and contribute in terms of productivity. We've also used, um, some of those bulls have also been sent um, or semen's been sent across to Australia to use in some of the, um, the beef progeny test herds over there. Um, and so we're going to get that really strong trans-Tasman link. There's about 10 or 11, I think, in, in the first round, 10 or 11 Angus, and there's one Hereford, and we need to work on more Hereford links to, to Australia um, as we do um, our next round of AI. So in terms of the properties that we're working on, um, there's five properties around New Zealand. Um, Number one there is Whongarar Farms, so Richard Schofield will, will tell us more about that operation. Um, we've got number two is Rangatike Station up on the Napier Ta Taupo um, Road there um, in some fairly high cold sort of country. Um, number three is Tautan, Tautani Station, um, and Matt Smith's going to talk about his operation there. Um, we've got Mendip Hills in, in North Canterbury near Cheviot. Um, and we've got Cabafay Station, which is in the Hacker Valley um, in South Canterbury, or really just over the, over the border from Otago. And we've got a range of um, bull breeds used in here. We've got um, Angus, Hereford, we've got Stabiliser, and one thing I should mention is that Focus are an important contributor to this program. Um, not just in terms of the, the, um, the input from the physical input, but also um, financially, they're contributing to this program. So um, we're evaluating some stabiliser bulls. Um, we're also evaluating some Simmental um, bulls and, and there's a couple of Cherylais in there as well as terminal size. So, so there's a range of, of uh, bulls there. All up, we've bred about um, 1,600 cows and 600 yearling heifers um, across the, the whole program. So in terms of project timeline um, and, you know, unfortunately the, the thing about beef genetics, as you will well know, it takes time. Um, and so we've, we've bred the first lot of cows um, at the end of last year and, and in January at Rangatike um, and waiting for the cows to be born now. And, and we intend to do another round of AI this year and then um, as we progress through, um, we'll follow things through. Now in terms of following cows through to... Um, um, to, to how long they stay in the herd, well that's a long term undertaking, um, it's an intention and um, but you know looking out beyond sort of 2018 plus. So now I'll just talk a little bit about um, the beef economics and breeding objectives work that, uh, that we're also doing. Um, and essentially there's two reasons why we're doing this, um, firstly um, we actually need to do some of this work to be able to inform um, and measure the impact of the the impact uh, of 
of the BLG investments. Um, and, but as we also do that, then there is the opportunity to provide um, breeding indices to, to New Zealand breeding sector um, with some new features. And so um, that's what I'll talk about. Um, and we've, we've um, created, I guess, some draft indices which um, are there and, and you know, could be used by the New Zealand industry. Um, we're certainly using them in some of the economic analyses that we're doing at the moment. And they've got a number of key features um, which are really sort of specific, I guess, to, to New Zealand or really try and hit um, some of the, the issues that, that we hear about. And I'll sort of just briefly run through that. So the first big issue is um, valuing the cow impact on pasture quality. So we all know what our system is in New Zealand. And if I was to say what's the one, well, there's probably two key, key differences in the New Zealand industry um, from most international industries. Um, one's the fact we've got a big dairy industry but I'll put that aside for a minute. The other is the way we use our cows in a mixed sheep beef farming system. Um, our environments, yes, they're tough. Other people have tough environments too, believe me. Um, but, so, but the fact that the way we use our cows is actually reasonably unique. Um, not totally unique, but reasonably unique. So um, one of the big questions is, you know, the cow's doing a job for the sheep enterprise. How do we value that? So... Um, we've created an, an index model which has, um, I guess, a, a quite a it grinds it reasonably fine in terms of um, the cost of feed during the year, and we are trying to incorporate that impact that the cow has on pasture quality by by varying the price of feed at different times of the year to to reflect when she's really doing a job, um, and, or when she's um, perhaps competing with with a sheep enterprise. So that's the way we've approached that. Another um, big issue really is the impact of cow size and, and how we value that or panelise it um, and how we manage feed deficits. And this is, I guess, a little bit different to um, the way, for example, in southern Australia when we talk with our colleagues over there, they talk about how they value feed deficits in terms of um, putting out supplementary feeds for, for longer or shorter periods depending on how the cow body condition score responding. Well, the reality is here, our cows don't get those supplements. They're out on the hills. We can't even get the supplements to them if we want to. Um, so we've chosen to, to look at, um, at the, the feed cost of a bigger cow by reflecting it on either a lower stocking rate or a lower condition score. And that's how we've dealt with, with that in our modelling. Um, and then talking about condition scores, so Really one of the big issues, and, and you, we hear it all the time about people saying that I want, you know, essentially we want fat in our cow and we don't want it in our carcass. And so trying to get the, the balance of that right is a challenge. If you look at genetic parameters, um, which is sort of all the information that goes in behind breed plan, um, they actually suggest a reasonably low relationship between fat and fertility, which sort of makes you step back and say, well, actually, farmers don't agree with that. You know, we're hearing it from farmers all the time that actually fat in the cow is really important. And I think there's a reason for that, and that reason is sort of um, outlined in that sort of graph there, which I've got, which, um, which basically shows you that sort of at a higher condition score, um, the, um, there is less a relationship, but as we move down to sort of the condition score that our cows are farmed in commercially, so remember all the, all the, um, the genetic parameters that tend to be estimated in stud herds and a lot, most of that data is coming from Australia, as we, as we move down into sort of the, the more commercial thing, then that relationship becomes stronger. Um, so we can build that into our indices as well. Um, another feature, um, so we've now got branded um, beef programs and we've got, um, it really means that we need to, to think hard about um, putting a value on, on marbling. And then finally, we've got um, an approach which, um, which is sort of about sub-indices, so breaking up an index. And, and you saw Kent use this concept when he talked about the cow side of things and the feeder steer side of things. So we've also um, used the same sort of concept. And, um, you know, there are ways that we can do this and, and perhaps present the information which, show, which shows at a glance what the strength of two animals with the same index are. So I've used two Angus examples up here on, on this slide. Um, and, and this is actually the way that the Irish um, present their data. So, um, so there's an overall index for those animals and it's almost exactly the same, it's almost identical. But people that know those bulls know that the actual, those bulls themselves are reasonably different in their strengths 
And so we've divided it up into a growth index. So Chisholm on the right-hand side is a very strong growth bull. Um, we've got carving ease, um, we've got maternal, and then we've got carcass. And you can see at a glance that um, you know, if you're really wanting to go the carcass way, then you go with progress. Um, if you're more fo focused on um, perhaps the, the growth and, and maternal, then you'd probably go um, with, with Chisholm. So just a snapshot thing, and you can get all that information looking at the EBVs, but that's just a quick way of presenting that. So um, thank you. Thank you.